I think charities have a high trust factor though. Mm -hmm. What they don't have is high care factor when it comes to the everyday Joe and Jane donor. All right. Welcome, everyone. I am so excited to be here today with Lynn Wester. Lynn, thank you so much for joining me. I'm so happy to be here with you, Mallory, and your audience. Hey, everybody. (laughs) So tell everyone just really quickly sort of what brings you to this conversation today. And then we're going to jump right into our strengths finders because we started chatting about that and it was just too good. I'm here to have a conversation about the way in which our nonprofits can change our gratitude and build an attitude of gratitude with our donors. So I'm so excited to be here today. Oh my gosh. Awesome. Okay. And now hit me with your top five strengths from Strength Finder. My top five strengths are uh, strategic is number one. Okay. Ideation, futuristic, competitive, and significance. Okay. So those are really similar to mine. I'm learner, achiever, strategic, ideation. Learner, achiever, Very strategic, interesting. Ideation, and something else. I forget what my other one is, but yeah. And none of mine are like human ones either. No, so, okay. it's very interesting because I look at the people that have harmony and woo and empathy and I'm like, oh, look at you guys all up in your feelings all the time. And I'm like over here going, but what about the work? And where are we going 10 years from now? And what is the future going to be like? And what's interesting about the competitive and significance, the competitiveness doesn't come in like, let's win the race. It's excellence. It's like, we have to be the best. Like if we're going to do this, we're going to do it well. And then the significance, when I first got that as one of my top five strengths, I was miffed by it because it it means that you want your work to be seen by others. You want your work to matter. Mm. And I think for me, how I've interpreted that softly to myself is that it's important for me that we bring to bear our profession as a profession Mm. and people don't just see fundraising as something they can do on the side or Mm. get very casual about. Like I've dedicated my career to like, this is actually a career. It's not just some charity hobby. Mm. And I think that is where that comes in for me. But yeah, I don't, just because we don't have them in our top five also doesn't mean we don't have woo or empathy or all that other stuff. It's just, those aren't the top ones that drive us. That's really Mm -hmm. what that means. But I'm very linear and strategic. And I think as a consultant, it helps organizations get out of their feelings and into, Mm -hmm. but what about the work? Because there's so many feelings, but as you mature, you realize that you have to take the time to figure out how everybody's feeling about it. Otherwise you'll just bulldoze them over. So mm. and they're okay. done that. wait, I want to talk about that because I'm really curious what you like your perspective on that feeling piece, because so I was sharing before we hit record that, you know, I'm an executive coach. And so I feel like a lot of what I do is actually try to force people to get into their feelings, but the feelings that they aren't really are like acknowledging or talking about like the feelings around, like, I'm really feeling uncomfortable asking that person for money because of blank, or I feel like something about me isn't good enough to sit in the room with blank donor. So that's the type of feelings I, but what, when you say there's a lot of feelings, like what are the things that you're like, all right, we got to kind of get ourselves out of that piece of it. (laughs) Yeah. I think for me as a consultant and as a snow globe shaker change agent, um, the feelings I most readily deal with are that of resistance to change, right? Mm. So we work in nonprofit world. People, like we are 10 to 15, sometimes 25 years behind modern business, for-profit business. And we take that as this martyrdom card or we're like, well, I'm doing all I can. And we benchmark against other nonprofits. And we get very much defensive and in our feelings when people say are critical of us, mm. our push, push towards excellence and I understand we're underpaid, we're overworked, blah, 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 put all that to the side and understand that the work I'm trying to push them through is better in the end for the donor. Mm. So change. So uh, when I say people get in their feelings a lot, it's resistance to change. It's fear. Um, Over the last two years during the pandemic, it's been absolute shutdown sometimes like deer Mm. in the headlights, paralysis, fight or fright kind of deal. Mm. 
especially a lot of leadership, if, if it isn't an event or a gala or a, they don't know what to do with themselves and they're like Mm -hmm. stuck. And so I deal with a lot of feelings around, but this is the way we've done it. This is Mm -hmm. what's comfortable and safe. And, and in times of tumult, people default to what's safe and comfortable, Mm -hmm. you know, um, it, it, think about the way we dress right now when we're stressed out, we don't go put on, you know, I don't know a lot of people that go put on uncomfortable, fancy clothing. I mean, I might put on a sequin dress for, you know, for fun, but most of us go into the sweats and the, you know, and the comfortable soft fabrics. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's like you eat a bowl of pasta <laughs> and you don't go, you know, craving kale out there when you're stressed out all the time. <laughs> I don't know anybody that craves kale, but I'm sure there's someone. I crave a big bowl of mac and cheese, but, uh, you know, or a taco, but, um, you know, so I think that's the feelings I'm talking about Mm. is, um, they're working very hard, but they aren't working very efficient or I don't want to say smart because the people in our industry are so intelligent. Right. And they're, but, but that whole putting, the process before the feelings. What if a donor doesn't like this? I heard once from a donor this, and we get hung up on that. Mm. And we allow one person's opinion of our event, nonprofit, uh, like um, communication piece, email, that one person has 20 years of influence over us. Mm -hmm. And we're paralyzed with that analysis paralysis that I'm sure you you work through as an executive coach where, um, and, and so one of the things I do because my side of the brain is the linear analytical data-driven, I have feelings, I'm very passionate, but I don't allow them to get in the way mm. of making that uncomfortable. Being uncomfortable is where I live and where I thrive. Mm. And so data, using data and having data inform decisions can take some of the emotion out of the whole kerfluffle. So I love that because I think what you're talking about, I mean, you and I are totally aligned here because what I, what I really try to drill down around the emotional piece is not the like surface level emotional awareness that we might have, like I'm stressed or I'm exhausted or, you know, all these things, but okay, what are the thoughts or the beliefs that are leading to that feeling that we hold? And the thing, the the way in which data can be so powerful is to really help us say, oh, that thought or that belief is not true because that piece around like the one person, right? We had one angry donor who wrote us about us emailing too many times at end of year. And now for the rest of our career, we're going to send one email at end of year because of that. And so the data that you provide, and you know, I've seen some of the, the materials you put out in reports, like I, I think it's just so powerful. Like when I'm asking people to question and like, okay, so, you know, you're feeling uncomfortable about sending that email. What are the thoughts and the beliefs behind that feeling? And they'll say, you know, I'm, I'm worried that they're going to think I send too many emails and I'll say, okay, what data do you have to support that? belief, right? And what data do you have to support a a different belief? Um, And then like, if you can start to rewire those, then the feelings can also change, which is awesome. They can. So my psychologist calls the negative stuff, automatic thoughts, like your automatic, I mean, I'm an anxious person. uh, And so my automatic thought is usually, you know, something bad's going to happen. And then it, Mm. it rolls on. And what he tries to get me to do is be pragmatic and, and compassionate towards myself and try to not suppress the automatic thoughts, but combat them with reality. Mm -hmm. So the automatic thought is this, actually here are the facts. And I think, you know, that's where the strategy part of our strengths, you and I shared strategy Mm -hmm. and ideation is I'm a constant problem solver. So Mm -hmm. when someone comes to me and I think maybe here is the difference um, in not having the top five be emotional strengths necessarily, Mm -hmm. Someone comes to me in an emotional state, whether that's, I have clients in crisis, a donor's done something wrong, they've had a scandal, you know, a donor, Mm -hmm. a gift agreement has gone astray, or I get a client coming to me saying, I can't work with so-and-so, or they're just, they're just in, in a state of emotion. My default is to fix it. Mm -hmm. That is my default. It makes me an excellent consultant. Sometimes it makes me a poor empath 
because Mm. I don't necessarily, I want to fix the systems that got us to the mistake or to the problem. They want someone to say, oh, dear baby. Oh, no, Mm. bless you. Oh, it's going to be okay. And sometimes I say, this isn't going to be okay for a while. We're in a mess, but here's the solution out. And um, I find that sometimes people didn't want solutions. They just wanted to tell you what was wrong. Mm. Whereas I automatically go into miss fix it mode. Oh, you and I are very similar there. <laughs> I have to I catch my myself. Friends. Yeah, me too. And so when I care about you, um, I try to solve the problem. And I think uh, what people need sometimes is for you to say, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry this is happening and live with them and their feelings for a minute and then solve the problem. Mm-hmm. And I think those of us with that, that ideation and that strategy are like, oh, I just want to fix it. <laughs> yeah, totally. And if I, if I fix it, then it won't hurt and it won't yeah. be so upsetting and everything. And we skip the step of saying, oh dear, oh dear. Mm. And I think, uh, no, I think it takes two kinds. I think there are people that would be the, oh dear all day and never take Mm. action to fix it. Mm -hmm. Yep. So they're just whirling dervish of, of, of lament. And, you know, it'd be right now, if I spilled my water glass all over my computer, I can't sit there and be, oh dear, and start crying (laughs) and stuff. I've got to clean up the computer first. Because yep. as I sit there and cry, the computer is soaking in the water. <laughs> mm, yep, totally. So it's a tension between the yeah. two. Yeah, it's interesting. In executive coaching, we we talk about this a lot, or we I think about this a lot in terms of like acknowledging and validating. So like if someone is spiraling in their emotions, they need a moment of like being acknowledged and validated for how they feel. And then that's going to diffuse likely enough of that energy to sort of get them into a space where they can start to talk about, okay, like, how do we move forward? Like how you're feeling makes perfect sense. And, you know, and, and really giving that space for a minute. And even with myself, I mean, there are times where like, you know, something really bad happens and I know I just need to like have a pity party for a second and I will set a timer on my phone and I'll be like, all right, Mallory, you can just like have your pity party for five minutes and at the end of five minutes, you're going to get it together and you're going to move on. And it just helps me like contain yep. it a little bit, bit, you know, like on, on both sides. Um, can I go back to something you said earlier that I just think is really fascinating. I'm curious how you manage this for yourself. This is personal. So you can tell me if you, if you don't want to answer this, but um, you know, you shared about, you know, being an anxious person yourself, but also really thriving in discomfort. And I find that a super Mm -hmm. fascinating combination. So can you talk to me a little bit about like how you manage that? Because I have a feeling a lot of folks who are listening to this are like, might consider themselves anxious people, but not know how to lean into discomfort. Absolutely. So I have an anxiety disorder. Um, I've had it for, well, I've been diagnosed for about 18 years. Um, I'm openly talking about my mental health now. I didn't always. Um, and I think it's one of the things I can do if I help one person by saying I have an anxiety disorder and that normalizes it for someone, then awesome. Um, I think my anxiety disorder both helps and hurts me in many ways, right? Just Mm -hmm. like any gift we're given. It was a gift that was given to me. Thanks mom. No, I'm just kidding. Um, (laughs) but anxiety keeps me on my toes. Um, that does just because I'm anxious doesn't mean I don't like being uncomfortable for me. Anxiety comes, Mm. um, from a lack of understanding, Um, for me, anxiety is caused when people are overly emotional and not, Mm. not grounded in reality. Sometimes for me, my anxiety can come from not feeling in control. I'm a control Mm. freak. I love it. I moved to an Island in the middle of COVID because I couldn't handle that. I couldn't control my environment Mm. and, um, it was causing so much anxiety that I wasn't leaving my house and I wasn't healthy mentally. Mm. And so here's how I feel about discomfort versus anxiety. 
I try to look at discomfort as something exciting and that the more uncomfortable I am in my situation or in a work scenario, there's something exciting on the other end. Mm. So I love to fail at work. I love to, that's where the ideation and futuristic comes Mm. in. I am willing to be on that bleeding or cutting edge of something because so were lots of inventors and creative minds. Mm. Um, They also had a lot of mental health issues. So I feel a kindred spirit with Picasso (laughs) and and all the other people who have suffered. um, You know, my brain doesn't stop going. Mm. And so that can be hard. But on the other side of being uncomfortable is usually something really cool. Mm. What I have to get used to and what I prepare my brain for is if you get through this uncomfortable experience, you will a learn something either bad, good, or indifferent about either yourself or other people, or, you know, um, or, um, you know, on the other side of this discomfort is an opportunity that you would have missed had you just sat there and been comfortable. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example of discomfort for me that people are going to laugh at, but when my business started taking off, I had to hire a concierge, an assistant. Her name is Shannon. And turning over control of my calendar and my email mm. inbox and my daily life, like, like I always found it pretentious that I have somebody schedule me or mm. that people wouldn't be able to access me easily. Do you know what I mean? Like um, with one phone call or an email, mm. uh, turning that over to her was discomfort. It was uncomfortable for me. It has made my business soar to trust a human being Mm. with not just my calendar, but my back then it was my travel. It was um, understanding that she can provide better customer service than I can myself. Mm. I don't have to take everything on to, um, to, to really thrive. And so by putting myself in that uncomfortable situation of having somebody else be in charge I get better customer service for my clients. I have a more, less chaotic day. My calendar isn't triple booked and I'm not going to Portland, Maine when I should be going to Portland, Oregon. Um, <laughs> and I'm employing someone and giving them value when otherwise, do you know what I mean? They mm-hmm. wouldn't, she's a working mom and um, has some circumstances where she can't work a daily nine to five in an office. So, you know, I'm also giving an opportunity. So, but the, the letting go was a process and an uncomfortable mm-hmm. one. Mm. Yeah. So when you think about yeah. like your own experience, which I'm so grateful for you sharing, and then you think about how oh, you yeah. manage the, your clients in sort of the change management piece and the helping them understand when they're feeling maybe what they're perceiving to be as anxious or stressed, or like sometimes I'll hear from my clients, like, I just have an intuition that that thing is bad, is like a bad thing to do. And I'm like, okay, it's, it's fear. It's not an intuition. So like, let's like unpack that a little bit. (laughs) How do you, how do you support your clients to really think about, um, and maybe this goes back to that data piece, but in really thinking about sort of like, how do they make the right decisions and sort of navigate some of the natural feelings or stimulation that's going to come from it. Sure. I think that it's really important because most of us in the nonprofit world are so tied to the work that we do emotionally. You know what I mean? We love what we do. We're passionate about it. I think what we have to do sometimes is realize our place in the work, our place in the world, like that That whole Simon Sinek start with why, why am I here? Mm -hmm. What is my purpose? Um, It really does ground you in what is important. So at the end of the day, one of the questions I ask my clients that really, I think befuddles them because they're not asked it enough is what would success look like? Mm. And what are we willing to sacrifice for success? What are we not willing to sacrifice for success? So, you know, that may be something as simple as, well, I'm not willing to work on a Sunday afternoon, or it may be something as big as I'm not willing to have a donor do something ethically gray Mm. just to get the money for my organization. Or, you know, 
we're going to implement new DE&I standards at our organization. And if our donors don't like that, then we're going to have to have some crucial conversations. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, I think the other, the other thing is also, and maybe this is why in the past couple of years, I've been more open about sharing my mental health journey is one of the great things a consultant can tell you is that you're not alone. Mm -hmm. So, um, I have the good fortune of helping people through crises in nonprofit fundraising, whether it's um, I dealt with Livestrong when Lance Armstrong got on Oprah versus um, I've dealt with financial scan, like you name a scandal, mm. it's happened to a nonprofit. And sometimes when they first call or they first connect with me, they're just so devastated this has happened to them because they want mm. the world to see them as good and pure and they don't, 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 they don't want to lose, you know, faith from their donors and, 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 and sometimes I have to lay out to them. Okay. Do you have this going on? And they're like, no. Okay. Do you have this going on? And they're like, no. And I'm like, well, those seven things are other seven clients I'm dealing with this week. So mm. it's not that bad. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, okay. Mm-hmm. Right. Like we lost a donor's $10,000 check. Is that a good day? No. Does that mean we're going to have to close our doors and the end of the world is coming? No. Can we work on our processes? Absolutely. Will Mm -hmm. donors forgive us? Absolutely. Human beings have far more grace. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that I've learned in the pandemic um, is that we should have, before the pandemic, given our donors a lot more grace Mm -hmm. than we ever gave them. Mm. we didn't put enough trust and grace in our donors that they would be there for us, that they don't need a fancy, shiny event, that they don't need a cup with our logo on it, that they purely want to do good, most Mm. of them. Mm. And they're looking for people to partner to make that difference or to make that change. And like, for example, right now, of course, the horrible situation in Ukraine is happening. People find the way to do good. So they're like, I don't really want to give to a nonprofit. So I'm going to go on Airbnb and I'm going to book a place in Ukraine. And it's like $42 a night. And I'm going to do that for 10 nights. It's 500 bucks to me, but it means everything to that family who's been displaced and is who now is in a refugee. I'm at least going to give them that money. So people find ways to be generous. We need to trust them more that they can find ways to be generous. Okay, I think you just read my mind because I wanted to talk about this Airbnb situation. And actually, um, I wanna explore this with you because I think, so I just deeply went down a social media hole this weekend watching Mm -hmm. people posting about this Airbnb situation and um, pe- you know, people were doing a number of things like buying digital art via Etsy and all this stuff. And what I found myself reading a little bit compulsively was the comments about why folks were deciding to do that versus to give to a nonprofit. And it was mm-hmm. really blowing my mind. Not that any of it was necessarily shocking, but it really just kind of, um, it kind of reinforced the work we have to do as a sector to make clear about what we are here for, what we're doing. And so there were kind of two big pieces for me. One is like the, the some of the distrust that I saw in a lot of those comments. And, and it wasn't even necessarily being phrased as distrust. They were writing, at least I know where this money is going. You know, ah. at least I know this is actually going to Ukrainians. Ah. And I was like, wow, are we doing that bad of a job that people are going first to funnel money through for-profit businesses? Not all of us are, but some of us are, uh, you know, to be honest. Um, So I'll give you my perspective on why people are finding other outlets than certified 501c3s, let's put it that way, like, or churches or, you know, institutions. So they're going individual routes instead of the institutional route. So, so I am a monthly donor of World Central Kitchen. I mm. love the work that they do. So what I did is I went and made a 10 times my monthly donation, one-time gift. I do that anytime there's a disaster that I feel connected to or um, because you know why? They immediately tell me where my money goes. And they're like, hey, today we stood outside of the train station and we handed out water mm. and then we made mm. meals. And these are Ukrainian volunteers helping us. And so there's immediate impact. 
right? Mm. What I don't get oftentimes, and I get that from World Central Kitchen. I get that from Team Rubicon. I get that from the charity waters of the world. I don't get that from a lot of organizations. Do you know what I get? If you could just help us some more, Mm. if you could just give more. And so here's what I'll say to you about the Airbnb phenomenon. I think there's some simple things. Yes, there's distrust. And I, I don't think it's as distrust as it used to be. But remember that some of those, the big charities are big businesses. Nothing wrong with it. I'm not going to get into the overhead argument. I don't want to no. even, you know, no. we're not doing that today, if you know what I mean. <laughs> like, I'm, not, I'm overhead and I'm happy to be overhead. So here we go. But if I give to the Airbnb, that person and their family is going to be directly impacted. I don't have to wait the three to six months for the money to be funneled to them. Um, I, they get to choose. So they're empowered by that money. Uh, there, my understanding uh, as I've been reading a lot is that the Ukrainian people are a very proud people. Mm. And if I also am of a, uh, descent of a very proud people, then I think I don't want to accept charity proud. Like mm. there's, there's a hard, there's a hard, like, I cannot imagine my father accepting charity very well. Like he mm. has always been a giver his whole life. I think if he had to go to a food bank, he would have a tough time pride wise. And I think it would break him. So number one, nobody's asking for that money. So they don't feel like they're accepting charity. Number two, it's immediate and they can spend it however they want. Not here's a box of grain Mm. or do you know what I mean? Like Mm. here's here, here, Mm. here's the things we think are best for you. Here's Mm. what you should be doing. Mm. What if in the middle of all Mm. that, I just want a bag of Doritos? Mm. Like, you know, I think about a time of crisis for myself and, you know, they want, you know, you want me to buy water and, you know, what if I just want something, a comfort item? Mm. What if I want something that's bad for me? Right. So people, we give them prescriptive things that we think are good for them. And then finally, I think the other thing is, I'm going to make that gift through Airbnb. And guess what? Airbnb is not going to ask me for more money and they're not going to be put me on a mailing list Mm. and they're not going to, you know, I've had the same experience. So many other, and I'll speak for America. Americans have had, I give, gave to a charity. I give every year. I give to lots of different organizations on giving Tuesday. I gave to a well-renowned international aid group at nine in the morning. And by 1130, they were asking me for more money. And over the next year, I tracked it. And every three days, they asked me for money. Every three days, I have it documented. And that is the extreme. But gosh, that feels harassing. Yeah, feels like what we often talk about for like congressional campaigns in the U.S., presidential congressional campaigns, kind of the worst of the political fundraising that we see, um, which isn't actually most. I did a series on political fundraising and was fascinated to learn that actually like the grassroots political fundraising is not done like that at all. And so those but those big races, they kind of set this tone. They lead to a lot of beliefs that I was holding about political fundraising in general. And so you think about then the way these big nonprofits are setting a tone for the sector, right? Even for those smaller nonprofits that are being much more responsible about their communication, that's really unfortunate to to think about. I I love what you said about about the Airbnb piece. And and I just want to be clear, I'm not criticizing in any way people's desire to express generosity in a number of different ways, I think. But I think it's an interesting thing for us to look at, to say like, okay, what's happening here that does feel good to people? Why are people choosing to make this decision? There's something that you said that I really want to double click on and sort of ask, ask if we can explore, which is this piece around that it empowers both the giver and the receiver. Um, And that that is something that we like it takes out the bureaucracy not just of the money but of the decision making in the process yeah talk to me what do you think yeah it's not my so if i'm a true generous person it's not my decision how you spend the charity i give to you like if we go back to maimonides ladder 
the 12th century Jewish philosopher who says he ranks the ways you can give. And the best way you can give is anonymously for something that they will use to improve their lives. But he doesn't dictate how they will improve their lives. Mm -hmm. So that could be you getting an ice cream cone one day. Like if you're a single mom Mm -hmm. and you've got three kids and you're living in a hotel, it may be taking the kids out for Frickin' McDonald's. It's not my place to judge why you're not buying vegetables with that money. Mm. It's not my place to say you bought your kid a toy out of a gumball machine instead of a book out of a library. Like, who am I Mm. to know what you need when you're in crisis? Who Mm. am I to know? Like, that's not my place. If I'm truly generous, I say to you, here is a gift. You use it however you'd like. And I hope that it will always um, make good for you in your life. And I think the other thing that I am probably seeing in the Airbnb type givers, the what I would call the givers who are not giving to the big, to, to the large relief organizations is, do they see themselves in the donor bases of those large organizations? Hmm. Probably not. Look at, Ashton Kutcher and Mila Kunis, right? So they're running a GoFundMe. More people Mm. relate to them than the Koch brothers or Mm. Michael Bloomberg or wealthy philanthropists. Like, I don't think they're seeing themselves in our organization. I think our staffs aren't diverse enough. I think we don't value what I call small but mighty gifts. We Mm. don't value the $50 donor. We only value you when you give us a big old Happy Gilmore check. You know, Mm. we only value you when you give us large amounts of money. It's about worth and fundraising. And so I wonder if those people see themselves even belonging to our organizations. Again, Mm. these are all conjectures, right? From an outside perspective. But I mean, they're educated conjectures in that I gave money to a charity because I work in the industry and I know the good that they can amplify, right? And was I tempted to go on Airbnb and do that? Yeah, I thought it was a really cool idea and it was innovative. And I think that's the other thing. Mm. Nonprofits aren't innovative enough. We don't find enough ways to to help you separate yourself from your your goodies, as I call them, your time, talent, Mm -hmm. your treasure. Like, look at some of our giving forms, for God's sakes. Like, it takes two minutes and seven clicks and your, Mm. you know, your birth date and your home address. And why do you need all that? Just link me to my Apple Pay, my PayPal, my Airbnb. I can do it in one click. Hmm. There's something to be said for that. So I think there's a lot of factors there. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited to see that, but I do think that we should empower beneficiaries and not judge them. And that to me is true generosity. Mallory, you're having a tough time. Here's $200. You don't ever have to tell me. Mm. You did. I'd love to know that it made a difference. Like one day, six years from now, if you say, you know what, that day that you gave me $200 was the day that I was considering, you know, being just having a, I was just in a bad place. Mm. Right. Or, you know, that $200 meant the difference between my kids playing sports that year or not playing sports. It doesn't have to be so Mm. dire either. Right. It Mm -hmm. could be what we call normalcy right? Mm. It could be. So for example, who am I to judge a dad who's got two kids and they're living in temporary housing? We give him $200 and he spends it on kids' uniforms to play softball or t-ball or whatever. And he doesn't spend it on a deposit for an apartment. And people are like, well, he should want permanent housing for those kids. Mm. Which one's going to bring them more joy? He's the dad. He gets to decide. Mm. Not me. I don't get to impose my values on him. If I truly am generous, I could, I mean, I could not agree with you more. And I think one of the things, there's a lot that you said that I wish we had like 10 hours to explore, but I'm going to keep myself focused. (laughs) So I want to, I want to talk about this small, but mighty donor piece, because I think actually when you said that, I was like, yeah, wow. Like the $50 donor, the hundred dollar donor, they're not going to hear back from that organization. They make a gift to probably ever other than their, the stock donation in this crisis, but they could book four nights on Airbnb for a very specific family and they've made an impact. They know they've made an impact. 
in a very clear way. Talk to me about how you like work with your clients around the recognition of inclusion of that small but mighty donor in a way that that changes the giving experience. Sure. So this is my pedestal. I've been putting behavior-based donor relations on for a couple of years now, pre-pandemic. It always stunned me that somebody who gave to an organization for 40 years never got a call from a gift officer, never heard from the president, never got an invitation to an event because quote unquote, they were just a $50 donor. Then that person passes away and leaves the organization $3 million. And people are like, what the hell happened here? And I'm like, Mm -hmm. you were blind. And, and that $50 may be a larger portion of their income than the $50,000 check that someone else writes. And they write it in the good times, in the bad times, through bad leadership, through good leadership, through a bad economy, through a good economy. So I have my clients do one simple exercise. And we usually do this in a room, you know, with their whole staff. Tell me the name of the biggest donor to the organization. Half the staff can tell me it's so-and-so. Okay, tell me the person who's given the longest consecutively to the organization. Crickets. Crickets. Nobody can tell me that person. Eugenia Curtis at the University of Tennessee, who's been giving 77 years consecutively, who until we found her had never been visited. And that's not a condemnation of the University of Tennessee. They are paid to go after big bucks. But behind them are these silent heroes, the Eugenias, the Burton Tilly Hoods at University of Central Florida, like these people, like I've been giving to my alma mater every single year since I graduated. It's not a lot of money. But where is the recognition for that? And and where are we as a business? So what I've devised is a plan. So my clients have to bless and release the chart that says $50, we do this, $500, Mm. we do this. We throw it out. We set it on fire. We we recycle it, whatever (laughs) is appropriate thing to do these days, depending on. And we now do behavior-based thanking first time donors get the most love and support. Why? Because we lose 80% of them after their first gift. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine Mallory? We run businesses, right? Imagine if eight out of 10 of our customers bought one thing from us and never came back or clicked once on your podcast and never came back. Mm -hmm. My business would close right away. Mm -hmm. Can't afford that. Repeat business is everything. Yeah. Why Disney and Ritz Carlton and Apple Mm -hmm. and and, like, it's why like you order something from Amazon, they send you the wrong thing. They're like, just keep it. We don't care. We just want you happy. Here's a new one. Mm -hmm. And so first time donors get the most love and then loyal donors, Mm -hmm. regardless of amount, you don't have to give us a lot of money. It's a lot of money to somebody. And that may be you. Mm -hmm. So we need to stop judging people's worth by how much they give us. Like there are organizations who say, we will not bother with you until you give us a thousand dollars. Who are you to judge? Yeah. Who are you to say that my $50 isn't good enough? And if you treat my $50 poorly, then it will never grow. Mm. And so we have to look at donor behavior, monthly donors, donors who last year gave you a hundred dollars this year, they gave you $200. We have to build our databases and trigger our behaviors based on the donor's behavior. That's what businesses do, right? Mm. Why do you think you have loyalty cards at the grocery store or the free punch at the local deli where you get a free Mm. sandwich? They're rewarding you for your loyalty because they know if they give you a punch card, you'll be like, you know what? Let me go back to Sammy's because two more (laughs) of these and I get a free sandwich. (laughs) Because if you have the choice Mm. between them and the other deli, the other deli doesn't reward your loyalty Mm. or it's getting to know the people. So, you know, I'm, I'm not a a caffeine. I don't, you don't need me to have caffeine, (laughs) but my friends, my friends who have their loyal caffeine depots, as I'll call them, whether it's Starbucks or Dunkin' or Tim Horton or the little tiny house ones out in the West, the, the brothers or Dutch brothers or whatever it is. They love it when the person knows their order. That Mm. is knowing them. 
It is saying, I know who you are. I know your name. I know that you drink a frapple lap of ding dong with a splash of coconut milk, or, mm-hmm. you know, I know that you bring a dog with you. So here's your puppuccino or, you know, mm-hmm. that, that matters every time it's getting to know the person. It's for me, my equivalent is uh, when I walk into my local watering hole and they're like, Hey, Lynn Amstel. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> and they know my beer and they put my coaster on it and they know I like it in a koozie. So it doesn't sweat all over my hands. And they're like, are we going for some onion rings today? And I'm like, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, like these people know me. Mm -hmm. And so it it would be different if I walked in and that bartender that I see three times a week or two times a week is like, Hey, would you like a a beverage? And I'm like, yeah, I I was here two days ago. I (laughs) drink six Amstel. (laughs) Do you think I want a pina colada? I don't like, I'm not going to get a wild hair Mm -hmm. for a pina colada today. So, Mm -hmm. so that's, that's what I want to do. So, so that's what I think is important. Yeah, gosh, you know, it's so interesting because I feel like when we give examples like outside of the fundraising behavior or like, but, but using sort of that same example, it may, it's so clear, right? Like inside our little fundraising bubble, we're like, well, we're so busy. And so like, how are we going to remember every little thing? But just taking that moment, like I worked in a coffee shop growing up. And I started recently talking about the fact that I have ADHD. So me remembering people's orders, not happening, like not happening, but I of course remember their faces and I treated them every time. Like, it's so good to see you again today. Like how, you know, how did blah, blah, blah go yesterday? Or this is early for you. Like, do you have something special today? You know, like I used what I could, like what I would remember how I could connect with them, but you're right. Of course, being like, surprise, blank face, like no recognition that I see this person multiple times a week, that would be so strange. And I think like, sometimes we forget when we're like on the other side, you know, that that's how our donors feel. So I'll give you an example. You give monthly to an organization, you sign up for their monthly donations, and then they send you an email, give now. I I, I do. I give to you monthly. Do you not know what a segment? Do you not know how to sort your Excel spreadsheet? And it's it's rude. It's yeah. it's it's rude. It would be like you took your vegetarian friend to a steakhouse for dinner. Like it's rude. Do you not know who I am? Do you not mm-hmm. care? Mm-hmm. And so so to me, I think you know we we were talking about the Airbnb. It's not just that donors don't trust us. Sometimes they don't like us. Mm. I'll give you an example. I give online a lot and the form will not have any sort of selection. I don't want my title and I don't want MS, but, and then I get an email or a piece of mail, Mr. Wester, because Lynn is a gender neutral name. Mm. Why do you have to title me to to address Mm -hmm. something to me? Put my, or they leave off the E fine. My mom liked vowels. She had extra money at Wheel of Fortune. So she bought some extra <laughs> vowels. Rock on. But L-Y-N-N is not me. And Mr. Wester, mm. that's my dad. So you, it's mm. so simple not to screw this up. Like just care, just mm-hmm. try hard. So I think there is some, I know where the money's going to kind of thing. I think mm-hmm. most people, I think charities have a high trust factor though, mm-hmm. but they don't have is high care factor when it comes to the everyday Joe and Jane donor. Mm. Yeah. You know what? I'm really glad you said that because even when the word trust was kind of coming out of my mouth, that wasn't what I necessarily meant. Like in the old school way we've thought about, do you trust nonprofits? It's not about like, are they embezzling the money? It's like money. It's not 1980s and United way and stuff like that. Do I trust my generosity with you? Do I trust? Do I? Yeah. Do I trust? Like Yeah that you're going to honor this relationship. So it's a relationship just like any other. So imagine Mallory, we're friends. And the only time I talk to you is when I want something. Yeah. I got rid of those friends in my twenties. Yeah. I was like, I don't have time for you (laughs) or the friend that only talks to you when they don't have a boyfriend. Mm -hmm. I'm a girl. So, you know, okay. So you only talk to me when your big donors aren't doing something. 
Mm. Or like you, if, if charities were people, you mm. wouldn't have them all in your life. Mm. They don't behave well. Mm. They don't always behave well. We try hard, but okay. So you've invited me to your wedding, thrilled to get to go to your wedding, but you only write me a thank you note if I bought you a gift of $250 or more. Hell kind of crap is that? Mm. Well, the IRS says I don't have to provide a receipt if the gift is under $250. Yeah, but my mama says you're rude. <laughs> I don't care if I gave you a sticker that was five cents out of a gumball. That could be more meaningful mm. than the, the $500 candelabra somebody got mm. you. But who are you to judge me and then treat me poorly because I'm not good enough for you? Mm. So, so I think you're right in that it wasn't, you didn't mean trust. You meant the way we behave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We don't always do a good job. Or when, when people are, are married. So for example, you've got spouses, you're Mr. And Mrs. Idris Elba. It's my husband. You didn't Mm -hmm. know that, but Idris and I have recently declared our love for each other, but Mr. And Mrs. Idris Elba, where's Lynn in this? Why did Mm -hmm. you just make me his property? Mm -hmm. Because you follow 1950s guidelines of mm. what you're supposed to do. Mm. Well, hello, it's 2022. Mm. All right. So Lynn, tell everyone where they can find you. And for folks who are listening to this and probably everyone being like, oh my gosh, I need to work with Lynn and her team. What are, just tell them a little bit about what it looks like to work with you and who are the right folks um, that sure. should reach out. So uh, we are donorrelationsguru.com. You can find us at donor guru all over the internet, the interwebs as Al Gore invented them for us. So we're very grateful, right? (laughs) Um, My team specializes in communications, donor relations, events, and operations. So we don't, we don't specialize in asking for money. We are the thankers, the impact providers, the event planners, the communicators, We work with people who want to change. So if you are comfortable with the status quo, rock on, have a great day. We don't need, you know, like that's not our ideal partner. I ideal partner is somebody who wants to make a couple waves and use data and, and to drive that strategy. We're looking for people who maybe inherited a shop that's broken. Maybe people who want to convince their board of there's a better way of doing it or their leadership and really think about the unsung hero, the donor in, mm-hmm. in all of this. We lead with gratitude. We have a blast. We're very um, thick with humor and sarcasm. Mm-hmm. And um, we believe in all the things that Ted Lasso believes in and um, you know all that good stuff. But we also believe that nonprofit needs to be held accountable, that we're not perfect. And we're here to help make those changes and lead them. So come hang out mm-hmm. with us. Um, We have happy hours once a month for free. We have very low cost webinars um, and online courses that you can purchase, or you can go to our website, donorrelationsguru.com, and there's over 15,000 samples. You can download and copy them for free. We want you to have the resources to get up and running, thanking donors right away, low lift, low, like there's no cost to you, maybe your email address so that I can spam you, but um, (laughs) Just trying to behave like a nonprofit, you know, and so um, we're here for a dialogue and I'm here to have interesting conversations about people that care about our space. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, we're, we're, we're really successful because we stay in our lane and we know our niche mm-hmm. and we're practitioners. We actually do the work. And I think that's what sets us apart. Mm, thank you so much. And thank you for joining me today for this conversation. It's been a pleasure.